Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring approaches to self-healing. With me is Dr. Joyce Hawks, who is a biophysicist and also author of Cell Level Healing, the Bridge from Soul to Cell, and Resonance, Nine Practices for Health and Vitality. Welcome, Joyce. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. Likewise. You know, in our our previous interview, this is now our third, you used an interesting word which seemed to me to be the essence of self-healing. And if I had to say it in one word, which was the word you used, it would be allow. Allow is such a big word for most of us. Mm -hmm. And being a person who was very active, busy, thinking, doing, planning, to stop, relax, and allow information to come, allow experiences to happen, allow doors to open. It's been a long time learning, many decades. Mm -hmm. And I think most of us in our culture run around the edge of allow. Allow? What? It Really? Uh, Come on. So it is a very important word for self-healing. And that's allowing connection with divine source, Mm -hmm. relaxing to allow the energy of health to stream through us and information to come to us and connections to come to us. We're out there like, I've got to make this connection, do this, do that. It often blocks what it is that we really deeply think we need and want. Mm -hmm. Being here is an allowing. Uh, I've watched your interviews for years and never thought I would get to sit in this chair and be and have an interview, but with um, an event that we were both involved in on the History Channel, all of a sudden it was like, whoa, here's a connection, and now we're doing it. (laughs) It's beautiful, (laughs) allowing. Yeah, yeah. I remember many years ago I received a healing session from a healer, and uh, in fact, that's what he did. He he was a a big black man, and he, he had a big do booming voice and he simply said to me receive healing oh wow <laughs> like that and it was like he said it and i thought i got to do that <laughs> and but it it the implication is that healing is always there it's always yes. available at some level yes and being aware of that is a bigger jump than any of us ever anticipated it is there i mean why don't we just Remember that from the time we were little, because I think we access it when we're little. I see my grandkids and I go, "Uh uh-huh, they haven't forgotten that yet, Mm -hmm. but at some age we do. Well, I think part of the problem is a lot of people go through life like this, you know, they say, (laughs) darn it, something is pinching my neck. (laughs) (laughs) Well, could it be me? (laughs) That's a good one. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> or it reminds me of the old Saturday Night Live uh, skit with Billy Crystal where he says, yeah, one of these days, he, he, he said, I, I took my tongue and in the middle of winter and uh, saw if I could lick a telephone pole or a metal pole and my tongue got stuck. He said, I hate it when that happens. <laughs> Yes. Oh, ouch. And we've all done that at some point. Our mm-hmm. time is like, oh, I'm not going to do that one again. Mm-hmm. Oh, my. But, but a lot of, a lot of the, uh, stress, a lot of the, uh, tension, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of the situations mm-hmm. that lead, that create the conditions for illness are things that we do to ourselves. Very true. Very true. Our nutrition, the way we eat, the way we exercise or don't exercise, the um, 
emotions that we carry for a long time that cause huge stress, which mm-hmm. we know affect the body biochemically and physiologically. Yeah. And the things that we maybe avoid that would bring health to us, mm-hmm. being hydrated, having enough water to drink, uh, lots of, of pieces that lead to walking healthily. Yeah. And I know from an earlier conversation that we had that you made a point of saying, though, that you don't think it's uh, appropriate to, that people should feel guilty if they are sick. That, uh, you know, that even if it is something that they are doing to themselves, uh, feeling guilty and blaming themselves for it isn't going to help. That becomes such a blockage because mm-hmm. I've certainly worked with many people and I've had to face that in myself also of like, oh, I should have, I should have, blah, blah, blah. And that just blocks the opening for all of the healing that's available to us. Mm-hmm. So yes, we can recognize, oh, I really don't do well eating eggplants, whatever. I get sick every time I do that, whatever it happens to be. But it's simply an awareness, and then I get it. Now let me move on and open to the blessing of love, of compassion and healing. When compassion arises, our brain activity is different. Our beta waves, the fast kind of mind-thinking waves, are still there, but alpha which is a feeling of well-being, shows up in larger amounts, which for most of us in every day is quite low. Mm. And to have that sense of ah, relaxation, if you will, or well-being and, and receiving blessing, that's the allow what it brings us, yeah. and it's really healthy for us. Mm-hmm. That, that's a good lesson. You know, lately, on this very channel... Uh, I, I read all the comments. I can't respond to them all, but I do read them all. And I notice periodically people say about me, why is he smiling so much? <laughs> why, he, he seems too happy. He shouldn't be laughing. We're talking about serious subjects. Serious things. And, uh, for me, I, I feel like I made a commitment to myself mm. that I'm going to be a happy person. Wow. And, uh, I think, you, you know, it's not hard to, if you commit to be happy, uh, it's not as if I'm perfect at it by any means. I have my ups and downs, but um, I think that creates a, a general uh, healthy tone for the whole body. I agree completely, and I know in keeping my meditation practice at a daily level, mm-hmm. when I wake up in the morning, uh, and I've meditated the day before, I wake up in the morning feeling joyful. And I go, oh, another day. Mm-hmm. And having almost not come back from a head injury, one of the things that I do is I go, oh, okay, I'm here. Oh, I'm alive. Wow, I have another day. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I say, so how much trouble can I get into today? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and that sense of joyfulness Mm -hmm. is also good physiology that it does for us. It's healthy in vitality and all Mm -hmm. of that. You know, there was a parapsychologist, an old friend of mine named Jerry Salfin, who Mm -hmm. came up with a hypothesis that the way healing works, uh, he even did some experiments, as I recall, to try and confirm this hypothesis. I don't know how far he got, but his idea was that healing is a telepathic phenomenon, that you're giving your other person suggestions for them to mm-hmm. heal themselves, because we all have this capability of self-healing. We don't always remember that yeah. we have it, but by through through telepathic suggestions, we can awaken a, a person's native ability to heal themselves. I think that's true. Uh-huh. And each person listens in a different way. So the telepathy is even individually based. What does this person need to hear that I'm sending in mm-hmm. this format? that will help them find themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the chapters in my book, Resonance, the Practices for Vitality and Health, is titled Sensitivity and Joy. 
Now, many people say, I'm so sensitive that I take on everything and I feel everything and it's very difficult for me. All of the traumas of the world, all of the um, accidents where people got injured, everybody in a hospital, all the things that are going on in other countries, I feel it all. And and I, my sensitivity is horrible. And I've had many people come to me as clients say, I want you to s- do something to me so I'm not so sensitive. Well, what came in guidance with this chapter, Sensitivity and Joy, was that it's a gift to be sensitive. We have to learn how to clear the overwhelm which I'll mention in a few Mm -hmm. minutes because it's one of the tools of Mm self-healing so that the joyfulness can arise from within us. And I encourage whoever is listening, you probably have a good high level of sensitivity. It is a gift. And so in clearing, one of the things we're taught is, oh, you can have boundaries and that will keep you from taking on stuff. Well, sensitive people, boundaries just don't work. Mm. Now, early on, I found like I could wear an amulet. I could hold a crystal. I could imagine boundaries, and I still got clobbered. Mm. I'm going, oh, what am I going to do? So you're one of those sensitive types oh, yourself. Yes, huh? who was very unhappy about it for a while, so uh, I've been there. Yeah. And what I found and what I often say is there is no protection. And everybody goes, what? There is no protection. My experience has been the only protection is connection with source. However an individual experiences names, especially experiences, connection with source, the God of the universe, the creator, the source of all, the oneness. And so taking a moment to be quiet to connect with that source, and it may be just a few seconds, it might be five minutes, it might be ten minutes, it might be longer. But then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I feel myself again. I feel the depth of my heart, that center place of my heart and my compassion for myself. And that's a very healthy place to be. It's a place where joy arises naturally from within us. That's so beautifully put. Oh, thank you. So it's one of the main key allowing tools and tools, if you will, of Mm self-healing. Moving out of the self-blame, it's not like, oh, I'm so perfect and wonderful. We don't have to go there. It's just like, all right, drop the self-blame and all of that self-criticism and allow ourselves to be worthy of receiving blessing from divine source and then ask, what can I do with this? How can I serve with this? Myself needs to be in good shape to do that. Otherwise, I run out and I'm on the ground gasping. So self-healing is first. But then comes, then where does it go? And we'll cover this in another Mm -hmm. session. But Mm -hmm. right now, these tools of self-healing, and connection is the main one, connecting with your source so that you feel the blessing of love, the blessing of flow. It's kind of a um, like walking under a beautiful waterfall that's warm and comfortable and allowing the flow of that water to wash away that which you no longer need. And this was a meditation that came to me that I use personally and also that I teach. It goes like this. Anything no longer useful to me, I allow it to dissolve and flow away. It's not like I have to struggle with it or grab it. Anything no longer useful, I allow it to dissolve and flow away. But always I follow it with and I embrace that which is for my highest good. Because I discovered that when we release stuff and we don't replace it with something like the highest good or a blessing, that in a certain period of time, maybe short or longer, 
All of a sudden, oh, I'm back at it. I'm all clobbered again. I filled that spot that I thought I'd released with the same kind of yuck. Mm. So, once again, anything no longer useful to me, I allow it to dissolve and flow away. And I embrace that which is for my highest good. Mm -hmm. And I encourage people to use their own words and kind of rewrite it so that it makes sense to them. Mm -hmm. But I often do that four or five, up to ten times, and that helps also be in a place of self-healing, another tool. Well, also when you say (laughs) for the highest good is very interesting, especially in your case, because as we discussed in previous interview, you got clobbered by (laughs) a heavy leaded window that fell right on your head, caused a huge gash in your head, knocked you out probably for a couple of hours. You were practically dead. For all we know, you were dead in return because you had the equivalent of a near-death experience. Correct. Now, and and it changed your life. Yes. One might say that that horrible accident was for your highest good. It's a really good way to look at it. Uh, Honest to goodness, in all these decades, I've never thought of it that way, Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. And truly, it was for my highest good. Fortunately, it didn't destroy my ability to use my brain. Yeah. I'm very grateful for that because it could have. Yeah. But look what's unfolded that is so incredible in being able to assist people. Actually, when the calling came and I left the lab to do the healing facilitating work, I thought, I'll never write again. I'll never do another publication because I published a whole lot of things. I'll never speak in front of people before because my part of my job was giving lectures. I'll never travel because National Marine Fisheries sent me to Taiwan and other places in the world to work with other scientists and do things. So I thought, I'm just stuck in the basement of my house one at a time working on people. Whine, whine, whine. I have written more, I have spoken more, I have traveled more, and met more amazing people since that experience than before. Mm -hmm. And so now I see it in a different light, and I'm very appreciative Mm -hmm. for the whole experience. It was indeed for the highest good. Mm -hmm. So I guess we need then to understand that when we use a word like healing, Mm -hmm. especially healing for one's highest good, it may not mean the same thing as the conventional use of the term because it certainly doesn't mean a life free from all stress and illness. Mm -hmm. True. We're all going to die. We're all going to die at some point in time. Mm -hmm. And we forget that in the middle of it. It's uh, interesting that we have, that life is this incredible gift and it starts at a certain point, and it proceeds and unfolds, and at a certain point, we all die. Now, there are people who say, well, if you do this, that, or the other thing, you could live 500 years. Going, really? Mm-hmm. I, Goodness gracious, 500 years. I, I just can't buy that. I'm, I, I'm there not are into legends it. of, of a, <laughs> a Indian guru named Babaji written Babaji. about in, in Yogananda's autobiography yes. of a yogi who is supposedly several thousand years old. Wow. It's amazing. It uh, truly uh, I is. I mean, that might be pos- uh, within the realm of possibility. I can't rule Could it be. out. I, I know pe- several people have written books. They've met this person. Amazing. <laughs> so. Yeah, and one of those incredible gurus would take um, stones and bless them and hand them to people, and they turn into gold coins. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, the miracles that yeah. come about are amazing. Well, as a parapsychologist, I'm well aware yes. of uh, what I call the boggle threshold. We all have a point <laughs> at which if I tell you X, Y, and Z happened, you're going to say, it's absolutely impossible. I won't even consider it. Yes, and and I, I have seen too many examples of things like that that actually did occur. That do occur. Pe- but people have a, le- a limit to what they can accept. That's true. And so for self-healing, I certainly have spoken with people who have limits mm-hmm. where the word allow has not really entered their 
uh, consciousness and their activity. So for self-healing, allowing yourself to meet someone, maybe a doctor who's go, oh, I get what's wrong with you. Everybody else has said they don't, but here it is, or a naturopath or an acupuncturist or a energy healer person, that opening the door and allowing someone to connect who can bring a level of healing. Mm-hmm. What One of the things that I've noticed in my work is that there are times someone comes who is just beginning the healing process. And so my job, so to speak, or the opportunity is to take them at a certain level. Mm -hmm. And then that's as far as we're going to go and someone else then intervenes or they opens the door opens to someone else and they take them to another level. Mm -hmm. And then there are times when I meet somebody who's been through five levels. I'm the sixth and the seventh. And then there are times when I meet somebody who I get to put the frosting on the cake. Mm. I'm the last level, and I go, oh, wow, this is really great. And so it's a reminder that humility is important, like we're there to do what we're guided to do to assist. And when we're doing healing for ourselves, that there are certain levels where we can do that and certain levels where it's very helpful to have another person assist us. And some of us, I can't imagine who, really, Joyce, you, uh, <laughs> find it very difficult to ask for help. Mm-hmm. And I, when I have, and when I've needed to, mm-hmm. it's been a struggle to ask, but it's been incredible. So I know what it's like to not notice the doors that are creaking open, which are for healing for well, oneself. Well, I can well imagine that as, as, <laughs> as a person such as yourself, a, a professional healing facilitator. Thank you. I'd like to call you a psychic healing facilitator. There we go. Uh, with a worldwide reputation, it must be like if to ask for help might seem like, uh, I don't know, inconsistent with that public image. Yeah, well, for example, a year ago, I was um, presenting uh, way up at, at a, a retreat center in northern Canada. <clears throat> Had to take four ferries to get there because mm-hmm. the float planes weren't running anymore. And I caught a little flu bug up there. Mm. And then I just ignored it and took the float planes back to Seattle. I had two days in Seattle, and then I was supposed to fly to Toronto to present for a conference. And of course, I wasn't going to cancel that. I was going to go and just forget that I was sick. So I went and I did a breakout session and I did an all-day session afterwards. And the flight went to Minneapolis and then into Toronto. So upsy downsy and then coming back to flights. Also, I got home. I had a fever. I was so sick. And I'm like, what? Rawr, rawr. Eventually, I went to the doctor. <laughs> they said, you get yourself to the ER right now. And they put me in the hospital. Now, I had my tonsils out. I birthed my daughter in a hospital. I had a knee replacement. And I forgot, yeah, I had one night in the hospital. And they were so kind to me, everybody. But I needed that help Mm -hmm. and an IV with antibiotics and all this stuff. And then it took me six weeks to really recover from this. It was like, okay, how about some time off? Mm -hmm. Some time both for yourself, some time for deeper meditation, some time for allowing and listening for guidance. So I've been there. Mm -hmm. And uh, when... I'm grateful at at my age, almost 80. I'm very healthy. I'm not on any medication. I'm very appreciative for the health that's mm-hmm. come to me. And I also know that the self-healing practices and the connection with others at times are crucial. If we do self-healing, we have to stop do, 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 doing out there and allow to take in for ourselves, allow that connection with source, allow our clearing, and whatever level that might be, energy around us, energy flow through us, focus of energy for 
whatever specific thing is going on. A bit of knowledge of cells helps with that. Mm -hmm. Another word that you've used that seems to me to be very important for self-healing is compassion. Compassion. Compassion for oneself, especially compassion for the places that hurt. Oh, because he, lots of times I've observed people, if they're in pain, they, they hate it. They, yes. and, and so they, and they hate that part of themselves that's in pain. And so, so they're angry at themselves because they're in pain. Yes. And rather than feeling compassion for themselves at yes. that moment, because I, my sense is that compassion helps soothe the pain. I agree completely. It does. And the hate that is there blocks any true psychic healing energy from getting there. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's almost like it puts um, a shell around the place that's in pain and that says nothing can impinge on this. This shell is so strong you can't break it. But when compassion arises, the shell dissolves. And then the energy that is needed, the psychic awareness that's needed for that place to heal comes. And that's when the messages come to us, Mm -hmm. which are unique for each situation, do this. Take a, take an Epsom salts bath with magnesium in it. Um, try some extra vitamin C. Um, you don't think about it now, but go for a walk. Or whatever it is, or bring energy spirals around you. Call your doctor, whatever it might be. See an acupuncturist. That's what you need right now. Mm -hmm. So that guidance is very much available to us when our hate drops off. And as you said, when our self-compassion arises, it's not easy. It's easy right now to say it because I don't have any place that I hate because I feel really good. (laughs) Uh But in those moments when it's, I don't want this pain, to remember to be compassionate and worthy of allowing blessings to come Mm -hmm. and compassion to be there for ourselves, totally important, Mm -hmm. not easy. Now, another approach that I've used uh, for self-healing as a psychotherapist, Mm -hmm. I've worked with hypnosis and self-hypnosis with people, that if you can enter into a relaxed, focused, Mm -hmm. altered state of consciousness, you could call it meditation, you can call it guided visualization, Mm -hmm. you can call it self-hypnosis, autogenic training, mindfulness. There are many different words, but it involves kind of focused intention and relaxation. A mild, altered state of consciousness seems to uh, work wonders. It does work wonders. I've experienced that personally and also with clients. And often when we're running the energy of healing and people are um, picking it up, it begins to dissolve that which blocks it and in almost a natural way mm-hmm. puts people into those states mm-hmm. also with or without the language of hypnosis. I haven't studied hypnosis, but um, Helen Folsom, who is a healing partner uh, in our group, uh, has. Mm-hmm. And so she has adapted um, the hypnotic uh, training um in ways that work with the cell level healing Mm -hmm. as very, very useful. And particularly when people um, acknowledge how stuck they are with a sense of tension. It reminds me of the research also on the side of what happens to us when we do relax, when we do actually go into those deep states of um, consciousness, Mm -hmm. Uh, Richie Davidson's work at the uh, University of Wisconsin has illustrated with Tibetan monks who've meditated some of these people 50,000 hours. Amazing. It promotes new brain cells. Neurogenesis happens. Mm-hmm. And so meditation is a good thing to prevent an aging, old, crunky brain. He's shown neurogenesis with meditation and when self-compassion arises. Also, the things that are blocked when we're in in stress 
unblock and our immune system becomes stronger and we're healthier. So we see one side of this, of the problems that come with too much intense stress and then just the opposite things Mm -hmm. that relieve that when we relax through whatever means we can. And it seems to me that when a person is functioning relatively optimally, Mm -hmm. self-healing is a natural thing to do. If I I know in my case, I I don't want to hold myself up as a perfect example, but I love my life, I'll say that. And if I'm noticing a little twinge of pain, and at my age, I get twinges of pain. I, for example, have uh, had arthritis. Uh, I, as soon as I feel a twinge of pain, I, I will s- endeavor to, uh, in my mind, uh, imagine that I'm focusing uh, healing energy or light mm-hmm. right there right to there. that to that spot, and yes. it just seems to happen almost automatically. At, at this point. That's wonderful, and that's a wonderful self-healing technique of bringing the light. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Sometimes when people close their eyes and are asking for self-healing, asking for a meditative experience, they see colors inside their heads. Yeah. Often it's purple, um, green, blue, the colors. I get a golden light. A golden light. Yeah. That's a great color. I often work with that color. Mm-hmm. And whatever the tone of light, whatever that frequency is at the time, is just right for wherever that pain might be. Mm-hmm. And then it's again allowing it to flow to that place. And my sense is with the flow, like a, say the fingers feel arthritic and the flow just washes the inflammation of arthritis out. So if, say, a joint is arthritic, what's going on there? There's levels of stuff happening. There's inflammation, but the inflammation then causes fluid to be contained there. And so as there's extra puffy fluid around the joint, around that area, it impinges on nerves And the nerves go, ouch, ouch, ouch. So here's a whole series of things Mm -hmm. that are happening. And so the first thing as we let the healing energy flow through there psychically is take the inflammation out, let the extra fluid be picked up by the body. It has a way to do that on its own. Let any of the bone cells that have gotten triggered into making little crunchy bits of bone, they're called osteoblasts that do that. Mm -hmm. They're osteoclasts. Those two bone type of bone cells work back and forth with each other to take away the crunchy bone and put smooth bone where it should be. And the arthritis goes away. So um, it's a... There are many dimensions to the process. We don't need to know every single dimension, Mm -hmm. but this is the level that it works. And that's why often the healing work, self-healing or with another, sometimes it's instantaneous and many times it is over a process of a number of days. Mm -hmm. Or months. Or months. Mm Mm-hmm. I know uh, when I interviewed Bill Bankston yeah. not long ago, a man who spends a lot of time in the research laboratory with mice who have been injected with cancer. Right. He he will <clears throat> work on them every day for six weeks or sometimes no. longer and uh, gets... R- Miraculous results, but Miraculous. it requires, uh, you know, daily focus mm-hmm. and, and an hour at a time. Yes. And so part of the self-healing is, well, it didn't happen today, so I'm giving up. Mm. And I, and we often do that, and yeah. I hear it a lot. Mm-hmm. Well, what did I do wrong that it hasn't worked immediately right now? I want it right now. So part of the self-healing wisdom is, as Bill has shown, as you've mentioned, is continuing that, mm-hmm. allowing that flow, whatever the modality is that seems to work mm-hmm. or that you're really attracted to, keeping with it for a while. 
You know, <laughs> oddly enough, you're reminding me of a McDonald's ad. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> uh, they ran a big ad many years ago when they talked about how what makes a business successful. Oh. And, of course, McDonald's, very successful yeah. business. They said, you might think we require great ideas. You might think we have to have the best people. There are two factors necessary for a successful business, patience and persistence. <laughs> <laughs> they said, that's how we have become such a successful corporation. But I can see that that applies to healing and very, self-healing. Very much so. Patience is not one of my personal high qualities. It's something I continue to um, be uh, have some confrontation on. This is a good quality, Joyce, do it. Mm-hmm. And persistence, yes. Yeah. Those two are very important for self-healing. Mm-hmm. Wow. Because my sense is, I think many of our viewers will acknowledge that in, in their own way, they're on a spiritual path of some sort. Yes. And, and my sense is when you're on a spiritual path, sooner or later, it's going to become natural for you to engage in both self-healing and then healing of others. Yes. I think it's just part of the path, ultimately. Yeah. And part of going back to the patience and persistence is another one of the chapters in the Resonance book about focus and clarity, that often we're distracted by so many things that being uh, comfortable with a focus of compassion for ourselves and allowing that focus to really penetrate all levels of our body, our mind, emotion, is another key tool to self-healing so that Well, one of the things when I'm working, I don't plan my grocery list or what I'm going to do at 6 p.m. when I'm finished. Mm -hmm. It is a calling. uh, The word demand came up, but uh, it's not harsh like that, but it's a calling to stay focused completely Mm -hmm. with the hour for that person. And it's... um, it's crucial for ourselves for self-healing to let the mind come back to compassionate focus mm-hmm. for ourselves. Right up there with being connected with source. Next step, mm-hmm. self-focus. I, and you know, I have to say this uh, for myself. Mm-hmm. If I'm engaging in a meditation or relaxation process for self-healing, which I do from time to time, uh, oftentimes it starts out like at the ego level, like I'm, you know, I'm going to sit down in my chair, I'm going to do this, and then it's like mm, ego, heal, 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 make it happen, make it happen, <laughs> and I realize, then I say, oh wait, nothing's happening. How can I do this? Because it's healing doesn't come from the ego, uh, but I persist. I relax and I heal, heal, and then I feel like a shift that Mm -hmm. takes place. At some point, I go from this, this isn't working state of mind to a state of mind of allowing. Mm -hmm. And, and I can notice that like, healers talk about it all the time. You feel energy, you feel heat, you feel various sensations Mm -hmm. that uh, will let you know that something is really going on. But it requires sort of like moving beyond this state where you think this is impossible, I, I can't do it, it's not happening. Yes, I so agree. And that's been also the journey of for cell level healing for me, in the early days, it was, okay, I learned this in Bali, I learned this in the Philippines, and now I'm focused on this group of cells, and that's where the energy is going, and that's where it needs to go to heal. Yeah, that target is important. I get that. And yet, the guidance has been, all right, once you've got that target, then, as you said, relax get the ego out of the way, and then everything becomes profoundly silent and quiet inside. And then both for oneself but for the other, if you're sending to someone, all of a sudden things begin to happen, such as feeling heat or or flow or things moving or, oh, I haven't felt this relaxed in a long time. All of those begin to happen. But it's in that state where the ego is not so active, where the 
I'm doing one, two, three sort of stuff mm-hmm. is we're beyond that. Yeah. And that's not an easy thing for us to teach ourselves or to teach others. It is a gift to be able to go in that deep state where it's profoundly, profoundly quiet. Uh, it reminds me of a, a session <laughs> uh, some years back where there was someone a thousand miles away in California whose brainwaves were being tested um, by someone that I knew from um, University of Washington. And uh, he had called me to start healing. She didn't know that I was starting. Now, at that point in time, I'd been tested brainwaves. And I discovered that I ran beta, the thinking mind, and delta, which is a very slow brainwave, usually only seen in deep, unconscious sleep, not the dreaming sleep. And it doesn't show up in the waking state for people. It only shows up when they're in a deep, unconscious sleep and when beta is shut down. But with all of the years of meditation, my brain runs beta and delta simultaneously, like the Tibetan monks that had been tested. So my theory was, this person is going to show, when we get the energy to her, beta and delta at the same time, Whoa, this is what this experiment's about. And this is at a point where I really was pushing for, here's the answer, I want to see it, you know, okay? Allow wasn't in my vocabulary then Mm. as much. So I start working. um, She doesn't know when it's coming, but she knows something's happened because she's all hooked up. So at the end of about 10 to 15 minutes was all we worked. Um, Juan sent back the data And it just cracked me up because her brain, when we started, had beta, it had very little alpha, it had theta, which is the imaging, it had a very tiny, tiny amount of delta. What happened to the delta? It should get bigger, should be there. It stayed very tiny, barely seen. What happened was her alpha waves the sense of well-being went up from 41 micro blah, 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 per whatever, to 110. Mm. And so a significant change. You don't even need statistics for this one. And then I found out after what the problem was. She'd been in a horrible relationship, and she hadn't had a sense of well-being for over a year. And just in those few moments of the energy reaching her, all of a sudden, ah, she felt relaxed, well-being without having to say anything to her. The psychic energy reached her at a thousand miles away, but her brain waves that we were testing mm-hmm. showed that change. Now, my theory went to pieces because no delta was there, but thank goodness she was blessed mm-hmm. and things changed. So, in self-healing, we don't always know what's going to happen. And in sharing our healing with another We don't always know what the results will be, but we can trust. Trust is another one of the synchronicity and dimensions of this work, that the highest good will happen. I think that's very important. (laughs) Because we can't know. And I sometimes hear from viewers and they say, how come you're not giving me more data? Oh, Why don't you prove to me that this works? You're talking, all these healers that you bring on, Mm. they're all phony (laughs) because I haven't seen the data. (laughs) Where's the data? uh, You know, I have to say to such viewers, you can read the data in research reports. It's available online if if you want to see data. But what we're doing here is often based on a sense of trust. Yes. I trust that you know very well what you're talking about. You've been doing this work professionally for decades. Thank you. And trust has not been easy for me. Mm -hmm. The scientist mind in me still says, show me the data. (laughs) And yet the expanded arena of this is, aha, just look, the data is all around you. Those responses, people coming back and saying, Oh, I'm so much better. I feel so much better. I didn't feel good for four or five days, but now I'm better. Wow. So 
the um, the work works. Mm-hmm. Well, Dr. Joyce Hawks, once again, a very informative and enlightening conversation. Thank you. Thank you for being with me. And so grateful to be here. Thank you. Well, I'm grateful that you took the time and the trouble to travel all the way from Seattle to Albuquerque. In the sunshine. (laughs) Thanks again. And thank you for being with us. 